Hello everyone! Welcome to a new video lesson. Today, we're going to learn something new about our subject, creative nonfiction. For today, our topic is about factual or non-fictional elements of a text. Remember that at the end of this video lesson, you are, you are expected to enumerate the factual or non-fictional elements of creative non-fictional text, perform analysis of factual or non-fictional elements of a given text, and discuss the importance of reading between the lines when it comes to dealing with people. Please be reminded that you're also expected to do follow along. Here, you need to prepare your one whole sheet of paper and your pen. Jot down your responses to every prompt, question, or activity given. Take a picture of that paper and post it in the link to be provided to you. As we begin this lesson, let us do this activity as our review. All you have to do is to pick which among the words inside the boxes is being referred to by each statement. Let's begin with number one. This refers to the arrangement of events that form the story in a novel, movie, and etc. What do you think is the correct answer? You are right. The correct answer is plot. Let's proceed to number two. This is the geographic location and time period in which a story takes place. What do you think is the answer? Correct. This is setting. What about in number three? This creates figures or pictures in the mind of the reader or listener. And this means something different too and usually more than what it says on the surface. Correct. It's figures of speech. What about number four? This is the conversation between two or more people. You are right. Number four refers to dialogue. And for number five, this is a person who is responsible for the thoughts and actions within a story, poem, or drama. The correct answer is character. Congratulations! Now, let us proceed to the factual and non-fictional elements of a text. When we speak of factual and non-fictional elements of a text, there are actually many, but for this time, we'll only be discussing 12 of these. And since all these or some of these elements were already discussed in our previous subject, Creative Writing, only six of these will be discussed this time. So we will be discussing about characterization, point of view, angle, atmosphere, symbol and symbolism, and scene. So let's begin with characterization. Characterization is the process by which the writer reveals the personality of a character. Characterization has two types, the direct and indirect characterization. Indirect characterization the author tells directly the reader certain adjectives that would describe the characters. For example, she was a cheery, always upbeat person. So the words cheery and upbeat would simply tell the readers the direct characters or directly tell the readers the character or characteristic of that person. However, in indirect characterization, it does not happen that way. Here, the author does not directly tell the reader about the descriptions of the character, but rather shows reader something about this character. For example, her lighthouse smile beckoned across the crowd. 
So this is just the same as saying that this character is cheery and upbeat person. However, the author did not directly say that or did not directly tell that. Rather, the author shows reader that this character contains or has this characteristic. Another thing about direct and indirect characterization is that in direct characterization, the author gives broad sweep or simply say the author simply summarizes the personality in a line by simply mentioning those adjectives that would directly characterize the person. However, in indirect characterization, the, there is this use of cumul cumulative detail or cumulative detail, detail like actions, words, dress, other details that build up a portrait. So, for example, the author in direct characterization would simply say, the child was so dirty. That's very direct. That's very, it's a summary of about the character in just one line. But in indirect characterization, the author would not say that. Rather, the author would describe how the child dresses up. Um, the author would describe about the child's actions, the child's words that would give the reader the idea that the child is dirty. So that is an example of characterization. Now let us have another example for characterization. So here for direct characterization, the, the author would simply tell that Gary is a nice and caring person. So the words nice and caring directly tell the readers about Gary's character. But when the author does this through indirect characterization, the author would give elaborated descriptions about Gary without directly telling that he is nice and caring. Rather, um, this will be done through words, through a lot of adjectives and even action words that would direct or that would tell the readers that Gary is such kind of person. So, to tell indirectly that Gary is nice and caring, the author would say, Gary watched his little brother for two hours while their mother was ill, taking care of his every need. He did this without being asked, and he did not ask for anything in return. So that's one example. Another example is for direct characterization, Gary can sometimes be very mean or rude. So the words there, mean and rude, directly tell something about Gary. But when the author does this indirectly, the author would say, The next thing I know, Gary was tearing up my rose garden, said Beatrice, his elderly grandmother, as she gave her statement to the police. She was still badly shaken after the attack. So that's it. The author here shows the reader what kind of person Gary is. So that is basically the difference between direct and indirect characterization. Now, before we proceed, let's have first this point to ponder. Going back to characterization, do you think humans in real life also do characterization of their own personality? That is very true. Humans do characterization or we ourselves do characterization of our own personalities. And this is something that we need to consider, especially when we deal with other people. Other people, especially those who claim to be true or genuine with their intention, are directly telling us that they are this kind of people, they are not going to do something bad, they are kind, and they are this, and they're their intentions are good. However, when dealing with any kind of people in this world, especially those that we don't really know that much, we need to do the reading between the lines or we need to figure out the indirect characterization that that per particular person does. We need to be very observant of his action, of his words, because by those things, 
we can then see if he really is genuine or pure. Also, as we deal with other people, we should also be consistent with how we directly and indirectly characterize ourselves towards them. When we say that we are honest and pure with our intentions, our indirect characterizations such as our words, our actions, the way we deal with them should also coincide with how we directly tell or characterize our personalities or ourselves towards them. I hope you get the point there, my dear grade 11 learners. So let's proceed. The next element that we are discussing this time is point of view. Actually, point of view ha was already discussed during our creative writing class. And I just decided to include this here because based on your scores and your answers for the previous weeks, it seems that you have not really gotten the very point of point of view. So please remember that a point of view is the perspective from which the reader sees or hears what's going on in the text as provided by a lens through which a narrative is told. So identifying a point of view is quite an easy task. All you have to do is to skip the dialogue. Don't mind the dialogue because whatever kind of point of view a text has, it will always have a dialogue. So dialogue does not count here or does not really matter. What matters is the narration done by the, nar the narrator, of course, of the text. So you would know that a text is in the first person point of view if the narrator makes use of the word I, me, my, mine, our, ours, myself, we, and ourselves. So those are examples of the first person um, pronoun being used in the first person point of view. And you would know that a text is in the second person point of view if the author makes use of you, your, yours, and yourself in narrating events. And you know that it is in the third person point of view if the author makes use of or the narrator makes use of the third person pronouns in narrating events such as the pronoun she, her, he, him, they, them, herself, hers, himself, his, themselves, their, and theirs. So for example, let's try to identify the point of view of this paragraph. This is actually one of the paragraphs found in one of the essays we had last time titled Epilogue. Or, okay, this one. The dispersal began in the mid-80s when Bombit went to the United States and never returned. He left some months after we'd moved to Green Meadows, yet I have no memory of him there. So, okay, so please take note that the author or the narrator makes use of the pronoun I. Okay, that one makes use of the pronoun I in narrating events in the text. So automatically, this text falls under the first person point of view. Sad to say, only very few of you got um, the item correctly in last week's module that asks you what is the point of view of this text. So that's it. Now let's proceed to angle. Angle involves the scope and focus in writing about real events. So for example, of course we know in your mathematics subject that a circle, um, which is composed of points, actually has a lot of angles in it. So for example, you are writing a story about your life. So that becomes now an autobiography. So from your from the day that you were born until today, that you are now 16, 15, or 17 years old, a lot of things had happened in your life. But, and that the whole thing or your life is now the entire circle. But when you write your autobiography, which of those so many things in your life would you like to share to your reader? Then you slice a part of that circle. So that that slice now becomes the angle of your text or article. 
just like in mathematics. So the entire thing, again, as I mentioned, is the circle. And since you are just choosing some points of those circles to become your angle, then that is why in this illustration you have angle, uh, the angle there. So that's it. Now, let us have an example. So this is a short biography about our president, Rodrigo Roa Duterte. So I want you to read this silently if you want to, or you may follow along as I read this text to you. President Rodrigo Roa Duterte was born on March 28, 1945 in Maasin, Southern Leyte, to Vicente Duterte and Soledad Roa, who were both civil servants. His mother was a public school teacher, while his father was a government worker. Duterte traces his roots to the Visayas. He spent his early years in the now Cebu, the hometown of his father. But his lineage has also direct ties from Mindanao as his mother hails from Cabadbaran, Agusan del Norte, while his paternal grandmother was a Maranao. In 1949, when Duterte was four years old, his family resettled in the then undivided Davao, where his father Vicente later entered the political arena and was elected governor of the province and served from 1959 to 1965. Duterte graduated in 1968 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science at the Lyceum of the Philippines University and obtained a law degree from San Beda College of Law in 1972. He passed the bar exam that same year. He served as a special counsel and later on became a city prosecutor at the city prosecutor's office in Davao City from 1977 until 1986 when he was appointed as OIC vice mayor of Davao City. He ran and successfully won the mayoralty post in 1988. Since then, Duterte has not lost an election. He is among the longest-serving mayors in the Philippines and has been mayor of Davao City for seven terms, totaling more than 22 years. He has also served as vice mayor and as congressman of the city's first congressional district. On May 9, 2016, Duterte won a landslide victory as the Philippines' 16th president. He was officially proclaimed by a joint session of the Philippine Congress on May 30, 2016. He is the first Mindanaoan president and the first local chief executive to get elected straight to the office of the president. So, this is the sixth paragraph biography of our president, Rodrigo Roa Duterte. So, I want you to analyze properly what do you think are the things about the whole life of the president which are picked and included in the angle of this article. Please have some time to analyze. So, let's do the analysis together now. As you can see, on the first to third paragraph, Okay, these paragraphs here talk about the early life and the family background of our president. And notice that on the fourth paragraph, in this particular paragraph, there is a shift in angle since this paragraph now talks about the educational background of our president. And lastly, on the fifth and sixth paragraphs, These paragraphs now talk about the political career of our president. So, if we try to ask ourselves, what is the angle of this particular text, we can then say that this angle includes the early life, family background, educational background, and political career of our president. So, um, if we try to go back to our analysis a while back, so we can say that the whole, the whole thing, the whole life of our president is like a circle and we just take, or the author just takes this 
um, points from the entire circle now creating an angle. So that is how we create or that is how angle is created in a text. Now let us move on to atmosphere. So atmosphere constrains the tone, emotion, or mood created by a literary text based on the details of the description and narration. So most likely this is about the emotions created by the text. So since it is now mentioned here, tone and mood, let me just clarify that when we speak of tone, this refers to the expression or the, the emotion expressed by the author towards the subject. It could either be that the author is very much in love with the subject. However, this is not necessarily the same emotion that the, that the reader should feel. Now, we now come to the word mood. Mood is the atmosphere that the author creates with their word choice and rhythm. This is now the, the emotion felt by the reader while reading the text. So when the author is very much in love, that's the tone of the author towards the subject, it could be that the mood of the reader is sad or maybe happy in effect to the to how the author delivers his or how the author reveals his subject through his or her tone so please remember that when i ask you to give the mood that is that refers to your um emotion as a reader so don't mention that the author um, feels sad in this particular text no because mood is for the reader while tone is for the author. So that's it. So let's now have an example. So this is an example. So it was a dark and stormy night. In her attic bedroom, Margaret Murray, wrapped in an old patchwork quilt, sat on the foot of her bed and watched the trees tossing in the frenzied lashing of the wind. So that's it. So the word quilt here, for the information of everybody, it's like a bed covering. So in our dialect or in our culture, we simply call this as bed sheet. So this is like a bed sheet quilt. So that's it. That's, that's the atmosphere, the, the tone there, the, the mood there. Of course, um, there, is, there is also a lot of times that the tone and the mood would coincide with each other. So when we say it was a dark and stormy night, it seems that um, it's like uh, the character here is being lonely because it was dark and stormy, yet she is alone in her attic bedroom. Can you imagine? So, so what do you think is the reason why the author chooses the word attic here when when he can just simply say bedroom so this is now uh the game of the tone and the mood when you speak of attic it's really um somewhere on top it's it's like an isolated place for a person and this is to create the feeling of sadness and lonesome so that's it now we have symbol and symbolism. So we also had this before in our creative writing class, but I'm including this once again because uh, many of you did not get the items that ask you about this last time. So when we speak of symbol, this refers to a person, place, or thing that represents an abstract idea or concept that stands for something beyond itself. Well, symbolism is the use of animals, elements, things, place, or colors to represent other things. So if you may, if you ask which, which one is a bigger idea compared to the other, it's the symbolism which is the bigger idea. The whole thing is symbolism. The, when the author makes use of something to represent something else, the whole thing that the whole process is what we call a symbolism. And that person, that place or that thing being used to represent something else is now called the symbol. So let's have one of the paragraphs you had in the essay I told you to read last time. The essay titled Epilogue. 
So this is how symbol and symbolism is used. So in the last paragraph of that essay, it says, Perhaps that's what houses are really about. The fundamental uncertainty of life. The slowly learned fact that the reference points by which we draw our maps and chart our course are ever shifting. And the life's cartography is never quite done. That isn't necessarily a sad thing. Perhaps the houses are no longer, but somewhere inside me I am still marveling at the break of day, at the way the moon illuminates the grass, at the way the lives of those I've lived would have crisscrossed and intertwined with mine, no matter how tangled up it all sometimes got. I count my blessings, the ghosts of houses past included. So the author here is now making use of the house as a symbol of like a place or a reference point or a symbol of uncertainty in life since the author here together with his family was transferring from one house to the other and that's it that the whole thing is the symbolism and the house is the symbol the symbol of all the uncertainties in life so that's how symbol and symbolism is used so one of the the answers to the questions last time that i gave you in your in your weekly home learning plan is what the symbol there is the house or the symbol there is the house itself Let's now proceed to scene. Scene is a dramatic presentation of events which involves good description, character, and dialogue. So basically, in scene, um, the author is presenting um, events with the use of description, character, and dialogue. So this is an example. This is an example of a fight scene. So when we watch TV, it's very easy to to relate to a fight scene but when we read a text it's all different because the author really has to give good description uh the good descriptions of the actions and everything that happens in there so that readers could relate so example is he sprang off from the table knocking it over and causing other diners to turn their heads in a split second he had pulled back his arm clenching his fist he threw it toward with a force that knocked Craig backwards when it connected. The dull thud and gasp of breath confirmed that he'd winded him. So that is an example of a scene. An elaborated description of an event with the use of actions and other description. So that's a scene. So I hope you understand the entire lesson. So if you have some misconceptions or you don't understand some points, you can just replay this video and go back to that uh, part that which you don't understand um, very much. But when you are now ready for an application, this time we will watch a video about an Ozamiznon who found a precious and expensive gem while tilting a land. After watching the video, identify the factual or non-fictional elements found in the story. Write your answers in your follow-along sheet. The factual elements that you're going to focus on are angle, atmosphere, and setting. So are you now ready? So please watch this video now. Ang ruby ay isang uri ng precious gem na may napakalaking halaga. Sa laki ng mga ito, kung mapapatunayan nga na tunay na ruby, para na rin siyang nanalo sa loto. Dating manager sa isang soda company, ang 36 years old na si Jan. Maaga siyang nagretiro sa pagiging empleyado para daw magkaroon ng sariling negosyo. Ang hilig ko talaga is more on uh, lending business. Nagpapautang ako sa mga public market, tricycle driver, uh, daily yung collection ko. Nung unang kumikita ang kanyang lending business, hanggang sa ang mga nangungutang sa kanya ay hindi na nagbabayad. Ang iba nagtago na. At ang iba naman ay pinambayad sa kanya ang mga panindang isda. Almost uh, three months na hindi ako nakapagnegosyo, nalugi talaga ako. 
Dahil hindi naging successful ang lending business ni Jan, lumuwa siya ng Maynila para dito magtayo ng negosyo gaya ng food cart. Nagtatayo rin ako ng mga hotdog carts. Inalagay ko sa mga public market. At nang magkaroon siya ng sapat na ipon, bumalik siya ng Osamis at itinuloy ang plano niyang pagtatayo ng bagong negosyo, ang car wash. Nang naguhukay na sila, laking gulat ng mga ito nang may mahukay silang tatlong kakaibang bato na kulay pula. Around 4 to 5 p.m., pagkatapos ng trabaho, naghukay na yung mga, mga laborers ko. Dalawa kami ng kapatid ko, nag, nag-check sa area. May napansin ako na kumikintab na, na bato. Eh, baliwala na sa akin yon Yung din kinuha ko, eh, parang na-surprise ako ba anong klaseng bato kaya ito. Kaya tinago ko muna. Gulat na gulat si Jan, pati na ang kapatid niya sa nahukay. Kaya agad nilang ni-research kung anong klasing bato ang nahukay nila. May duda na ako na ano siya, precious stone siya. Nung nakuha ko, nili, uh, nililisan ko siya, sinerch ko ngayon sa internet. May idea na ako na parang ruby. Napanood ni Jan sa Rated K ang kwento ni Tatay Carlos at ang perlas na nahukay nito. Kaya naman, nagka-interes siyang lumapit sa amin at ipatingin din ang mga nahukay niyang bato. Tinawagan at inilapit niya sa gemologist at jeweler na si Blaze Badar ang mga bato para ipasuri. Ganun pa rin, kung pumunta siya, para matignan yung bato niya. Sa unang test ni Blaze, mukhang ruby nga ang nahukay ni Jan. At habang di pa tapos ang tamang pagsusuri sa mga bato, ginawan muna ni Blaze ng papel ang mga ito para madala at maipakita sa Hong Kong. Physical appearance kasi yung kulay niya, kulay pula, masasabi mo ruby siya. Yung quality ng ruby marami, depende sa mga lumalabas. Tingin ko kasi mga ganyang kulay ng ruby, usually African yan. Kilala ang Hong Kong sa pagbebenta at pagsusubasta ng mga brilyante. Kung iistimahin ang presyo ng isang ruby, aabot ito ng 1,000 to 1,500 US dollars o 54,000 hanggang 81,000 pesos kada carat o 0.2 grams. At kung sakaling maibenta, sisiguruhin na raw niya ang edukasyon ng kanyang dalawang anak. Ipinakita din sa atin ni Blaze kung paano sinusuri ang mga bato. Kasama natin ang gemologist at jeweler na si Blaze. So siya po isang gemologist at malalaman po natin ngayon bilang gemologist kung ito nga ay tunay. Una, gagamitan ng tester para masuri kung ito ay precious stone. Ikalawa, ang heat test. So pinapainit natin. Ito man para matignan natin kasi kung ordinary stone siya, Puputok na siya. Ikatlo, ang hot and cold test. Matapos na painitan, nilubog naman ito sa tubig habang nagbabaga. At final test, ang physical manual testing. Sa ganitong paraan, kahit walang gamit, ay malalaman natin kung ordinaryo lang o precious stone ito. Pasado na siya sa test natin na kasama siya sa precious stone. Sa susunod na linggo, lilipad si Jan sa Hong Kong para sa auction ng kanyang mga ruby stones. Pero pupa sa kaya ito at totoo nga ba na ruby ang hawak niyang mga bato? Maibenta kaya niya ito sa malaking halaga sa Hong Kong? Abangan sa susunod na linggo, dito lang sa Rated K. And for your assessment, please read the essay Where We Wear, found in your Creative Non-Fictional Module 1, Lesson 1 to 2. In your follow-along sheet, make a table reflecting the 12 factual or non-fictional elements of creative non-fictional text and fill in the table with the, with the details found in the essay. A sample template of the table that you're going to make is found below. And for your assignment, please research on the different types of text classified as creative nonfiction. List these items in one whole sheet of paper and write a one to two sentence definition for each. Take a picture of your answered paper and send it to me via messenger. 
So that's it for today, my dear grade 11 learners. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any question, please send them to me via PM or via Messenger, and I will be happy to answer those. Thank you so much once again, and I'll see you next time. Bye!